What's up, you guys? Uh, well, you guys look great. I can't thank you all enough for being here. It's, uh, it's a total mind screw, actually, that this is even happening t in the first place. So, um, uh, my, To me, my goal here is to kind of be concise so we don't make it a creative afternoon. That was, that was, my, that was my icebreaker, so <laughs> hopefully, hopefully everything's real cool from here on out. Um, I think this is, here we go. So. Uh, speaking tips say be vulnerable, and uh, to me, um, I kind of have to go back to the beginning to explain why I ever wanted to be an artist in the first place. Uh, it says, as a child, I always thought I was ugly, and that is true. Um, it's not so much like a hate my face sort of a thing. It's just, I don't know, and, and some of you may understand this or relate to this. Some of you may not, but it's, you kind of, for me, I developed at a young age this idea that there was something wrong with me um, and I was always constantly trying to create something in life that was more beautiful than myself so for me the art is really uh, I always say to people if I really liked myself as a child I would have done something else you know <laughs> like I would have been a it's like I don't take selfies you know if I liked showing my face I would have never painted I would have just been photographing or whatever so um, to me the thing was really important to me because uh, you know, my style, Fab Crew styles, is a graffiti, you know, focused and graffiti influenced heavily. Uh, and it's funny because I'm constantly having to defend that style of art um, to potential clients or, or community partners that we want to work with because it just does not have much merit. And uh, as much as our city is growing, as much as you guys are on the up and up and pushing our city into a new and exciting place, uh, we're still in the capital of Indiana and it's still a very conservative place. So I'm, and property owners typically are much older than me, so I'm always having to have this conversation. Um, to me, I do believe art is a defense against the ugly things in life. Uh, we live in a world, that much of which we cannot control. We don't get to decide um, what the buildings look like. We don't get to decide where we're born or where our parents are. Um, and t for me, that was, a, it was very important. Once I sort of, as a child, began to draw I was very isolated, and to me it was just another thing to look forward to, and it was very easy to kind of lock myself away to it. Um, and I still believe, the reason that murals turned me on in the first place is that they are side by side with all these other things that have no meaning to me, you know? I mean, there, there are billboards and signs and corporate entities everywhere, and everyone is really happy, well, not happy, but they don't have a problem with it. It's like if you paid for the space, they don't care what you did with it. Um, but if it's art, it's totally different. People will literally say, if I have to look at it, I want it to be something that I like, which as you guys know is preposterous. <laughs> um, because there, no one asked me how I feel about all the designs of the cars on the road. There are only so many, and I don't get to decide. They don't ask me, you know, it's not, a, it's not customizable. So um, to me, art is a, it's like customizing the world as much as I can, you know, one, one, one at a time. Um, I touched on this a minute ago, but, you know, graffiti is a very difficult art form to do the older you get because it's inherently childish. It's filled with a lot of foolish act, uh, acts. And a lot of the people that you come up against, when you achieve the kind of success that we've had, are very jealous. Um, I've had buckets of paint thrown on my walls. I've had some pretty awful uh, slurs and comments written over my work, and, I, and not for the last time, I'm sure. Because a lot of people out there who think they deserve a shot but never did the work to get a shot um, are a little bit pissed off about it. But I would say if you want to be in the street, then be in the street. But you do have to compromise yourself when you want to, when you want to elevate to a higher platform. It's just, you just can't have it both ways. 
I want to start with a few questions that I always get so that hopefully at the end we hit some questions that maybe I haven't heard before. Um, people, <laughs> maybe I'll say that a different way. I want to, <laughs> I'd like to tell you guys some of the things I hope you want to know. Um, people always want to know, have you been arrested? And it's, it's kind of funny because I always say, yeah, I mean, almost everybody has. I mean, if you, if you, if you write graffiti and you actually participate in the culture, for any period of time and you want the level, you want the respect that you go for when you start, you, you have to write illegally. There's no other way to do it. You suck at art. Nobody cares about your work. So you have to go and find a place. And uh, yeah, most of us have been to jail. Um, and if you don't know, jail's a, a real drag and you guys should you know, find creative ways to avoid going there if you can. Um, <laughs> You guys are laughing because there's not a period at the end of the sentence, right? Uh, yeah, so I've heard of Banksy. Um, he is the single most important living artist today uh, and probably of the last generation. And I would say, in my opinion, the most influential person since probably Andy Warhol. Um, to say that I'm a fan uh, would be oversimplifying it. Um, Every artist wishes they could have a message and distill it in such an iconic style hundreds of thousands of times across the world like he has. Uh, it's pretty remarkable. I think we'll soon see the day when, you, when, when he kind of comes out of obscurity because there's a, there's a tipping point where, you know, there was a certain point where he could have given up his identity and his work would have lost all its meaning. And I think now, um, man, pictures of his face would go for way more than all those brick walls are tearing down right now. Um, people always ask what we use, and uh, when we do the walls, we use a paint by Montana Colors. It's a company in Spain. The line we prefer is 94. However, you guys would all be shocked to know how many brands of spray paint are out there. There's a new one every few months, it seems like. None of them made in the United States. The only good American paint is still Rust-Oleum, and it's not ideal for what we do, but it's very good paint. Um, we prefer something that's just low pressure, has a matte finish, you know the right temperature, whatever. So uh, if you guys are interested in any of that stuff or all the products in the graffiti industry which has exploded and is super weird now, um, I encourage you to go to bombingscience.com. That's one word. I don't encourage you to go to bombing-science.com <laughs> because I don't know what you will find there. <clears throat> um, but an interesting side note, you can smell the difference in the Chinese paint. It's really cheap and like not safe. so. You can tell the difference. Um, something that I'm always asked to explain is the difference between Bansky and, uh, and gang graffiti and the kind of work I do. Um, this to me is also a little bit laughable because I do find the differences to be very obvious. I'm hoping you guys will walk away with a similar perception. If you guys know anything about the Alexander Hotel, you probably know that their guest parking garage is filled with work by a man named Nick Walker. This is from the parking garage. Um, Nick Walker is, they refer to him as a contemporary of Banksy. Um, I like to think of him as the Banksy that is, will show his face and respond to your emails. Um, and I would encourage you guys to read, HuffPost wrote uh, a, a short piece about this it's, it's a scathing review, but it's actually also very insightful. Um, so check that out. It was really interesting what they had to say. But, so this is street art. Uh, street art is done with stencils and or posters and or objects that are somehow glued to things or pasted or whatever. Um, the obvious difference between this stuff and what I do and the reason that all graffiti artists have a, have a, a thorn in their side for street art is that this doesn't take nearly as much talent as going and doing something freehand. And it's as simple as that. It's a purist mentality. Um, this guy showed up. He had all these stencils cut. He's had them for years. He didn't create anything new for this. They didn't ask him to. They didn't want him to. Um, so he brought the stuff that he's been stenciling all over the, you know, England and the world for years. Um, it's kind of like a greatest hits. It's kind of like a cover band. You know, street artists, it's like the same image over and over and over. And graffiti artists do it too, but the difference and the reason we're so uh, arrogant about it it's just that we do it by hand. We didn't, we didn't uh, posterize a photo and cut out a stencil. I mean, I met a street artist uh, recently 
who designs all of his stencils in Illustrator and then sends them to a guy to have them laser cut. And which means he's not actually dragging any marks across the canvas. And uh, there's a real gulf between us in conversation, suffice to say. Um, super good guy. I'm not, I'm not prejudiced, you guys, okay? You know? <laughs> But, I mean, there's a big difference, and because, I, because I'm constantly having to explain the difference, I've got a passionate take on it. I've got a passionate take on it anyway. Um, this is a Toynbee tile. Some of you are familiar with this. If you're not, go to Netflix and look up Toynbee tiles. There's a documentary about this. Um, this is on Market Street in Indianapolis, and this is literally street art. Obviously, the difference here is there's some messaging involved. I believe it's warning us that the planet Jupiter is going to come back and take us. Um, the guy's totally nuts, but the documentary is really interesting because uh, the fanaticism of street art is remarkable. Uh, years ago, excuse me, there was a guy around Indianapolis named Tom Lale, and he would write his name everywhere. And some young graffiti artists became very uh, uh, fixated on him and devoted their, their lives to finding him. Um, and one day they found him, and that was it, you know. There's, now, they had to, now they just go to work, I think. But, uh, <laughs> so... The, in, the thing about street art that's amazing is the fanaticism of it, you know. People are so into it, you know, like if you order something from Bombing Science, something that'll come with your package is probably some Shepherd Fairy stickers. And most people are going to take those and slap them up somewhere. So that's another thing about street art that's kind of, you know, it would be easy to get your work up in, in a thousand cities across the world if you didn't have to go do it yourself, you know. This here is some doggone gang graffiti. It says, Goon Scod. <laughs> Brightwood. This is also from Indianapolis. Um, <laughs> I hope you can see the difference between this and my work in a few slides. Um, so, you know, they did it by hand, which is, you know, admirable, I guess. But it's, it's not art, it's, uh, it doesn't, it's, you couldn't go in front of a judge and say that you were a street artist, gosh darn, I made a mistake. Um, so yeah, this is, this is the stuff that I think people really should be afraid of. Um, this is illegal graffiti bombing. So this is the first time we're getting to anything that's within the culture of graffiti. Specifically, and here, here's what, this will get to, the, to the, the crux of the issue. Graffiti artists are offended by the street art label because graffiti artists are committed to a mastery of letter style. The idea that you can draw a letter or write your name with a style that is inherently yours is, or when, used to be, the, the major prize. With the advent of social media, we now have a, a, an overabundance of what I refer to as internet style, where you know, 15 years ago you could look at something and you, I could tell you the city that it was probably from because they were regional styles. Now that's completely gone. Um, anyway, so here we are in graffiti. There's letters, words, style. This is a piece by an artist named Ewok from New York City. The, all these are, are, from, are fa examples from Indianapolis. Um, and a moment, just a word about Choke. If you guys have not heard of this guy, uh, several years ago, much was made about Choke because he destroyed the city um, they took the, the news to his house to arrest him, and they covered his trial, and they just defamed this guy to the point that uh, it's kind of a little bit embarrassing because you can still find much of his work that remains today. The irony is he climbed up there and did that because he knew no one was going to go do it, not even the city. So this is a legal piece. This says Ewok, E-W-O-K. Um, this is a guy from New York City, one of the most influential graffiti artists on the planet, by far. Um, it's been our privilege to host him at the Subsurface Graffiti Expo along with a lot of our heroes that are living legends. I didn't want to show so much of that work because frankly it is a bit of a cryptic language and um, to a lot of people you see one piece you've seen them all. So uh, I would encourage you to go to subsurfacegraffiti.com and download our map so you can see what some of, the, some of these works are. This is still there on the south side on the American Tent and Awning Building. Um, so you can see here, you've got lettering, but the lettering is obscured. It's a painting. It's a design. It's like some hardcore shit going on in this piece. It is not this. It ain't Goon Squad. You know, it ain't the Toy and B, and it's not a stencil. And so I hope, if nothing else, you guys walk away with an appreciation for this is a, this is a painting. I mean, it's, 
it is an abstract art by its very nature, but it is a painting and it takes a serious degree of skill. This guy's been at it for 30 years. Um, you can't just do this. It's a, it's a serious discipline in my opinion. So this is one of our pieces. This has all of the cues and elements in, graf excuse me, in graffiti, but it doesn't, it's not overtly there to, to say something or be a message or advertise our name or whatever. Um, that is really a hallmark of our work. As I said before, once you decide you want to do work in the public space, you have an audience that you have to worry about. The graffiti audience is one audience, and if I were giving this lecture to a graffiti audience, um, or an audience of graffiti artists and graffiti writers, I would be showing you a totally different body of work and talking in a, in a totally different vocabulary, because um, once you get out into the public space, and you're really, in my opinion, if you're a public artist and you consider yourself to be that, you're serving the community. You're, you're providing your work as a public service in hope that you're going to raise the cultural capital of this place. Uh, and we wanted to do it so bad for years that we did it for free. Um, we still want to do it pretty bad, not so bad as we used to. <laughs> um, I'm not going to give you a history of graffiti. It's just, there's, it's really, I'm not an expert on the subject and it's, there's just not enough time in the day for you to hear all, everything I have to say. Some of you may have uh, heard of a guy locally named Sam Vasquez. Um, he is someone who lived in the South Bronx and he saw that whole thing go down uh, in the 80s and uh, I encourage you to look him up if you want someone locally face to face and he's got lectures online too that you can find. Um, I would suggest that anyone who wants to learn about graffiti, the history, the terminology, what's the difference between a writing and a mural and a whatever, I would encourage you all to get Subway Art. Um, it is the seminal book written from the outside perspective of our culture. Um, it's a guy who's a photographer who, be, who got embedded with these guys and hung out in the tunnels with them, kids, and uh, documented it all and attempted to create some kind of a, um, a genuine article that'll, that'll, he's got a glossary of terms. Uh, he explains some of, the, some of the things that go on, some of the idiosyncrasies that happen between artists and, and et cetera. So I'd encourage you to check that out. It's full of pictures. Um, if you can handle reading about it only, you really should read The Faith of Graffiti. It's the first book that was in wide release on the subject. came out in the mid to late 70s, and uh, its publishing and release around the world is ultimately what spread graffiti to Europe, where it exploded. Um, Europe is, has been ground zero for the true innovation, at least of our art form, ever since it started there. Um, Bomb the Suburbs is a book very much written from within the graffiti culture. It's sort of like uh, words of advice to the younger uh, writer, and it's the folk, you know, he, he covers, it's by a, a writer named uh, Upski from Chicago, and his whole thing is, if you're going to do this, try to look in the long term, because being a graffiti writer in itself isn't it, and if you, it, you know, if you do it long enough, you realize that you just got to chase a bigger rabbit than writing your name on the wall because it's not, uh, you don't get a return on that investment. You know, it's really just for you. And here in this city where the graffiti scene is barely existent at all, you get almost no return on your investment. I mean, the best case scenario, you become what we call a king where your name is everywhere and you end up like Choke, which is the poster boy for all sorts of awful um, assumptions that are projected onto him. So, Interesting, if you guys can get into that and from, from an insider's perspective. The Art of Getting Over is a book that was written in the late 90s by Stephen Powers, who was another Creative Morning speaker in New York. A very well-known graffiti artist, very accomplished in his time, um, and now he applies a lot of those techniques to public art, and it's pretty killer. But The Art of Getting Over is also written from the inside. A lot of words of advice there, too. The other book that I think everyone should check out, regardless of your level of interest, is a book called Muralismo. Um, and that book specifically addresses the modern day movement of people who write, paint, draw murals on walls in public because that's what they want to do. Um, 20 years ago, it was not that common. Uh, now it's just crazy how much. I mean, if, you, if there's an abandoned building in a city anywhere, um, 
you know, you should probably try and go in and check it out because you won't be the first person to see it. And Muralismo is a great book that documents that movement and they break it down into legal versus illegal versus public art. Super interesting. The term Muralismo uh, comes from the time of Diego Rivera and the labor murals. If you don't know who Diego Rivera is, we have computers, so you should look him up. Um, as a muralist, there's, nobody casts a wider shadow uh, than Diego Rivera, and until you get to Shepherd Ferry, so you should check that out. Also, I highly, 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 highly recommend that you find and watch Style Wars. That is the, basically the film version of the book Subway Art, put together by the photographers Henry Chalfant and Martha Cooper, who are, again, they brought this, the whole culture of graffiti out to the world. Um, Style Wars was a documentary created for PBS in 1982, and it was something we all passed around secondhand on a VHS cassette tape until they released the 20th, 20th anniversary edition. Uh, which is just killer. If you're really interested in seeing some stuff, get that, because they follow the guys and see what happened to them. Uh, it's remarkable. Reefer Madness is really hard to find, but it's really cool. It's not the hey, hey, hey movie. It's, uh, it's about reefer refrigerated train cars, which are the preferred train cars of graffiti artists because they travel the most and they sit for the least amount of time. So... Um, these guys become, there's, it's one guy in particular who becomes obsessed with one particular reefer car and he just scours the country looking for more of them to paint. Um, it's a really, really interesting documentary and it covers some of the people that were relevant in the freight movement in the late 90s, early 2000s. The freight movement now has exploded. It's insane. Um, this movie kind of helps you understand some of the philosophy behind it without, without going through all the different cars that there are. Um, when, I st when I started, half of my life ago, um, in the late 90s, nobody knew about this, certainly not here. Um, no, and that, to me, was the whole point, you know? I never felt like I, I was at home uh, in any culture that I had discovered. I never felt like I was the right person uh, to participate in so much of the stuff I was seeing. And graffiti was perfect for me because you're faceless, you go to these forgotten, ugly places, um, and you do your thing. You don't need the acceptance of all these other people. Um, because to me, if you're a boy in Indiana and you don't like sports, <laughs> you're not really a boy, are you? Uh, so childhood was a real, was a real mother for me. Um, and when I discovered graffiti, it was great because it's a true meritocracy. You get respect based only on what you produce, and that's all. So um, that's what it was all about for me. Some people ask how we work. Um, basically, when we get a job, incoming, we don't do any advertising. We only get incoming leads. When we get it, we go out to the site, we talk to the client and get their ideas. We take that back. We meet, come up with our quote and what we, want to, what we basically want to do. If we get approved and we get our first down payment, then you start the rough concept. Used to give that away for free too. Um, then you have rounds of approval, get your final concept, and then you execute. A lot of you are commercial artists or designers. There's really no different, very much the same thing. <clears throat> so I just wanna show a couple of the projects that we've done. There's no, there is no time at all to show everything. If you wanna see everything we've done, go to fabcrew.com. Um, the highlights are all there. But this was a bucket list item for us to be able to do uh, Indigo Bus, and this was our second one. And the real uh, treat on this one was they invited us into their space to do it. And uh, when I say us, I mean there's two of us. My friend Benjamin Long is here, and some of you may know him, and if you don't, we got computers. Um, so this was amazing to be able to do this. Here's a picture of Ben doing a finishing the piece at the Broad Ripple Art Fair. We began the piece in their warehouse, then they drove it over to the Broad Ripple Art Fair. And one thing that I want to say about this process was uh, how cool it was to work with the marketing team at Indigo because we wanted to cover the windows. It's not, you know, it's just not cool if you can't cover the windows. I mean, as a, you got to understand as a teenager, we don't have trains, we have buses, and you want to write on those buses, and this is as close as we can get, and it's killer. But what we did was cover the, film with, or cover the windows with a protective film, so we painted directly on all the windows, shot high-res photography of the windows, printed that on perforated vinyl, and put that back on the bus. So when you get on this bus, you can look out the windows. Uh, I've done it. So pretty killer. 
This is a terrible shot, but they also got us on a first Friday to, um, to do a bus shelter that matches. And uh, here's the, I later created an insert for that too, but when we were working on that at the Broad Oval Art Fair, a woman approached me and asked, how do you get into this? My son is really interested in it and I'm trying to figure out how to encourage him. And I laughed out loud <laughs> because if my parents wanted me to do it, I, wouldn't, I would have found something else to do. <laughs> Uh, and, and I told her as much. Um, I have turned down a lot of opportunities to mentor people's children because, as we covered in the beginning, I don't want to be the guy that you call when your kid gets locked up because they probably will. Um, it's just how it is. Uh, this year, the biggest thing for us that was just amazing was when um, we were contracted by the Indy 500. And they were bringing back the snake pit and they wanted to bring back some feeling of authenticity to bring back that old snake pit days. And any, anyone who was old enough to be at the old snake pit is laughing uh, and they think it's ridiculous. But when we first heard from them, we went, I went to the whiteboard and I said, oh, they want to bring back that old 70s flavor. So I drew this and I said, this is what we're gonna, we're gonna do, these just big ass like guys partying and chicks, you know? And we go back to them and they're like, well, no, nah, it's not really, I don't think we, uh, you know. So we ended up doing these, which are great, um, but it, it so happened that Mario Andretti and Linda Vaughn, who were staples of the Indy 500 back in the Snake Pit days, were both there. Um, and also Jim Neighbors, it was the last time he was going to be singing back home again in Indiana. So uh, we did tributes to them. As well as like, as, well as like this uh, Snake Pit on the right, the snake image is kind of like a photo backdrop, really was all it was for. Um, some shots in the studio, all hands on deck. That's our buddy Brian Presnell on the left side fabricating. Um, that's Ben over there doing the painting. Then this was a, an absolute marathon. We painted them, we cut them out, we sanded them, we built them, we shipped them. Uh, and part of the job was they hired us to paint live on the spot at the snake pit, which was a nightmare. Um, <laughs> they did not tell us we would be the only shade in the entire Speedway Park. There is no, there's no, it's like everyone's roaches out there. So uh, we're constantly having to kick people out from under the trailer um, and stop them from stealing our stuff. Snake Pit is a disaster and I can't wait to do it again this year. Um, just a couple shots of the absurd, Look, see, it's, it's exactly my point. Like we would go to take a photo of this and it's like you had to really kick people out and they're all like, I mean, dude, drugs, right? We were right next to the uh, police and uh, paramedics tent. <laughs> oh, the humanity is what I said. I saw kids getting dragged out, pushed out, knocked out. It was bad news. So here's the trailer as it relates to the hill. And here's uh, <laughs> just an ocean of people. So, and you see them all under the trailer. Um, some of those are our people, but we left as soon as the le leaving was good. Um, this is something I had to show. Uh, when the Super Bowl came to town, we were contracted by a production company in California to um, graffiti the entire NFL players party. They had been given uh, donated space in Plainfield that they wanted to turn into uh, a, an abandoned industrial lot, which as you can see, <laughs> they did. Um, so we got fake brick and painted on that, and uh, you know the shipping containers. They rented those. People brought them in and you know took them the next day. We have terrible photos because they once we left, we were not allowed back, and instantly when when people were gone, they tore all this stuff down, and it was over as soon as it started. Um, back here on the right hand side, you'll see a, a large piece with a, with a scissor lift in front of it. Part of that job was also a live paint of this big NFLPA thing, and again. You know, we try to impose our own style as far as the technique and the method, but there's no getting around the fact that they wanted union service, leadership, strength, and a whole bunch of other stuff in there. And, you know, you know, real street shit. You know? <laughs> so, um, so this, uh, I, they were one of my favorite clients ever. Um, this is a mural that I was contracted to do for the Lily Dew Day this year, um, which, as many of you know, is where you create a design and you create a paint by number scheme and in a perfect world 30 to 40 volunteers will come and help you paint it. But because of two rain delays, I had three. Uh, this guy with the white shirt owns property on the block and his handyman didn't show up 
So he came over to help us. So I had four. Um, super duper cool experience. Again, the real challenge here is how do you figure out how to apply this graffiti style that you're known for into a format, you know, that's for everyone. Because graffiti, the, the audience for graffiti is so small. Um, one thing I found too is we started to tape the concept onto the wall when we're working because people always want to know what it's going to be. Um, and it just saves a lot of questions and sometimes it sparks some good debate. So this would be the finished piece. Um, you know, my thing is trying to bring the colors and some of the shapes and the you know, vocabulary of graffiti into it. Um, but ultimately, this is on Double Eight Foods. Double Eight Foods um, is struggling. They're closing stores uh, way too fast for the neighborhoods that they're in and creating food deserts. And they wanted to make sure that uh, we protected the idea that they were a solution to the food desert, hence kind of the urban gardening feel. And Tarkington Park has a ton of money now dedicated to some projects where they're actually uh, going to be cultivating some stuff there, so pretty cool. Um, this is at 34th in Illinois, just up the way from Melody Inn, or no, not Melody Inn. Is it? Yeah. Yes, thank you. So my job is to apply stylistic cues from graffiti to other applications. It is not to paint graffiti. Um, a friend of mine said, you can argue the difference between hip hop and rap all day long and no one's gonna get it. And I attempted to do that at a friend's bonfire once and I walked away more confused myself. <laughs> but rest assured, um, we are not pay when we're out there with the scaffolding um, and the ladders and the, the concepts and all that, um, we're not painting graffiti. We're doing murals and we're doing our best to pay tribute to the style, but you just can't. So this is the orange hat and this is a, just a fantastic looking guy. He's got a nice shirt too. <laughs> that, was my, that was my best joke so far, I'd say. <laughs> uh, so Orange came to uh, me this year. They've come to us in the past, we, one, or, one or the other, um, to do different stuff. We've been involved with Orange for a long time. And asked to design it, this is my process. I gave them concepts. Uh, Ryan Hickey, who's kind of the brains behind Orange, chose this one. And then I used for the background some of the other ones. Um, <laughs> I, I want to know why that's funny, <laughs> but not now. Um, this is just cool because this, this was a, this was a kind of harken back to my days as a product designer in the toy and games industry, and it's always cool when you get a chance to do a little bit of product design, a little bit, not too much. Um, and this, these are some wooden hand drums. Again, uh, this is, I'm shifting into some other work because there's all these other things that you do, and the murals are a big part of the story, and the graffiti style influences everything, but there's other applications. So. Um, some hand drums that I've painted, pretty cool stuff. I, I'm a drummer myself, so it was you know, really hit close to home. This was a commission piece I did for some, uh, a, a family before Christmas, which was just cool. They, they knew the style of art they wanted, more or less, and they knew they wanted it on a shipping pallet. So we got in the shop and, and refashioned this shipping pallet. Um, it's pretty cool, a new thing. This here is probably, in my opinion, our greatest work to date. Um, this is a, a mural that we did for Subsurface Graffiti Expo. Go to subsurfacegraffiti.com. Um, so that's an annual event we do here every year where we invite artists from all over the country to come here and paint. And believe me, as I said before, living legends, some of my own personal heroes have work standing up in the city. Please download the map and go look at it, just so you can know what, what made me want to do this as a child, as a teenager. Um, so this is... Um, I'd like for you guys to imagine in your mind how much we probably got paid for this. And then I'd like to destroy whatever you thought and, because we did it for free. And in fact, it cost us money because that's really the price you pay. If you want to work in the public um, and you want to force your work upon people, there, you know, people don't hire you to do what you want to do. And I'm hoping we get to the point where we can, we can be that, you know, because it's, a, it's the place every artist wants to be. But uh, thus far, Fab Crew has been we, we double as, as public artists and commercial artists. So a uh, really cool piece that we did with a couple of other friends from around town that uh, is still standing. It's on the Value World in Fountain Square. Go check it out. Um, this is just some, some design collateral that we've done for Subsurface in the past and uh, a custom poster on the right that we had one of our fellow artists do. Um, this is one of the great joys for me every year is designing uh, and working as a team to create the branding for this. On the right is our t-shirt design, on the left is our uh, flyer. Again, this is a flyer for our after party. Um, it's three days of painting and we also have local music shoot showcase as well. 
then that's the shirt design on the right hand side. Um, and then I want you all to come to Elements Night. Um, it's on a different Thursday every month, but it is at the Hi-Fi and features Dam, which is a, a, a great band comprised of local musicians and they always have local talent that they feature. If you love hip hop and you never saw a band play it and you want to get that solidarity feeling that we're all after, go to it. Um, it's for us, by us, and you'll see some, some of us out there painting. And this is just a sketch I did uh, for an album cover for a group called Midwest State of Mind that immediately after the, re the release of this album moved to Austin, Texas. Um, didn't change the name of the band, which is kind of cool. Um, but again, it's someone who knew me for graffiti, came to me because they liked that style, but, but needed, it couldn't just be graffiti, it's just too specific for what they do. So these are my illustrations, I didn't, buy, I didn't put the layout in here, but a uh, really cool project. And I'm going to finish with some illustration. This is a piece I did for The Basement, uh, which a lot of you probably know, The Basement.tv, check them out. Um, I've been working with The Basement in various capacities for the last six years, and the people at The Basement longer than that. And this is a concept piece uh, for Every Walrus Can Fly. It's a children's ebook. Um, check it out. It's all 3D, and I did all the, the character work and, well, design and art direction, and we worked with a great team of 3D artists to pull it off. So these, in the last year, I've just been trying to, trying to um, really act, grind my axe as an illustrator again and get back to it and get, try to iron out my style. Some of you may recognize Ron Luhorn, Aaron Scamahorn here. Um, he's a friend of the show, as they like to say. And uh, he did this one night when we were hanging out, that pose. He was just, he was goofing off and I thought, I, I don't know, it struck me and I drew it on the spot. I did, the, I did the thing that annoys the shit out of me, which is I caught a moment of inspiration and I had to draw. Um, <laughs> So, uh, and then I'll, I'll leave you guys with this stuff. Um, I'm really, really proud now of my abstract paintings as well. It's all, again, I'm trying to take the vocabulary of graffiti and apply it to something with a broader language that transcends graffiti and, and really hits the level of art, you know, with composition and color. Um, so, I won't bore you, because I know abstract art is a foreign language to a lot of people, but graffiti is inherently an abstract art. And a friend of mine asked me, why is it that whenever a graffiti artist decides to make fine art, they choose to work abstractly? And I said, it's the only kind of art we're trained to do. Graffiti is an education in abstraction and twisting and bending of shapes. There's, the concept isn't really the story. It's not really what it's all about. So um, people call me graffiti artist. That's fine. It's good to be known for something. Um, I am an illustrator first. My skills as, as an illustrator are what allow me and my guys that I work with to do the work we do um, and create the imaginative stuff that we want to do. I'm a muralist because uh, when I was at high school, I was at Honors and Awards Night and the announcer said, Dan Thompson plans to attend Heron School of Art in the fall and paint murals to beautify his community. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and I did it. So, <laughs> crazy. Um, so all of that falls under the umbrella of painter, and the, what should be here is commercial artists too, because we're, 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 we're mindful of our audience at all times. Uh, some stuff, if you want to check it out, fabcrew.com, of course, is, is our mural portfolio. Dan from Indianapolis.blogspot, that's where I post all my illustrations and stuff that I'm messing with. Subsurfacegraffiti.com is where you can find information on last year's subsurface. Um, we don't have a new site up yet, but we typically do it in September. We're looking at June this year, so um, please go to subsurfacegraffiti.com and feel free to e email us uh, so we can kind of keep you in the loop. Um, and if you're on Instagram or anything, check out hashtag fabcrew317 and it'll lead you to all of our stuff. So that, I believe, concludes my, pre my presentation at this point, and I'm told we're gonna take some questions if I haven't eaten all the time. Who's gonna do that? <laughs> um, when you are putting your mural or your, your art on the wall, how do you initially get it onto the wall? Like when you have that paint by number thing? Mm. Uh, yeah, spray paint. Yeah, I, I just took the, I project, that particular thing had to be exact, so I projected it. I only worked at night, which is super hardcore. Um, <laughs> and so yeah, you project it, you get up on the ladder and you draw the whole thing just like with a marker, so. Pretty simple. Anything? Anyone? 
I nailed it, didn't I? No questions. Oh, here we go. Bet your ass we do. Yeah, yeah. We, we threw them away for years because they wouldn't accept them. And then uh, eventually, eventually we got to the point where we could puncture them, clear all the aerosols so that they're not a, uh, a combustion hazard. And yeah, they take them all day long. We got stacks of them in the studio. Oh, sure. Hell no. No, hell no. No, because for one, it's, you expect it. It's only natural. The, the places that we paint, most of what we do, you expect that to happen. But, I mean, I'm just going to be 100% honest. There's nobody around here that's even trying to do what we do. So the people that, that are dissing our work are truly haters. Um, and I, they're not even going to see this because they're, they're, so, they're just so far outside the universe that we're participating in. But, no, it's always a bummer. It's always a disappointment. Um, I don't mind if a person, if a person did a, a horrible piece of graffiti over me, it would turn about as fair play. But when you go up to my work um, and you just write just mean stuff, it's ridiculous. It never stops hurting. I, I, and we had an example of that recently that was super egregious. And I'm not going to go into it because it was highly offensive. But uh, yeah, it still happens as of two weeks ago, seriously. So yeah, not weird at all. That's the game we play. Anyone else? The sellout aspect. <laughs> no, some like to call it buying in. Um, but it's, that's a serious concern. Um, I mean, all you can do is... I, I, feel like, I feel like Metallica probably had this conversation with people before they put out the Black Album. Because you can only go so far. You know, your, your audience... Um, your audience are the ones who create the opportunities for you. And the audience that you speak to, uh, it has to grow in order for your work to grow. Because the graffiti community doesn't care. Frankly, they're happy for you to stay the, the same. The, there's a lot of effort put into keeping graffiti the same, keeping the traditional stuff alive, and uh, you know, must be illegal and it must be street. And that's, that's fine. But Homeland Security made painting subway trains a felony. And they'll kick your door in without a moment's notice. Um, and you really find out how easy you are to find when you paint the wrong stuff. So to me, the only way to justify it is, um, I love graffiti, but I'm, if I were just a graffiti writer, I wouldn't be up here talking to you guys. You certainly wouldn't know my real name. Um, and when you go to a client, when you turn that corner and you decide, I want a, to reach a broader audience, I want a bigger platform, frankly, the graffiti audience, they expect so little and they appreciate so little that you can't serve them only. There has to be more. So that's not to say that there's not work we do that's only for that audience, there certainly is. But when you wanna go into the public sphere and you wanna establish yourself as a, as a legitimate artist, you have to expand your vocabulary. And I will say this, as an artist, the only way to ensure that you're gonna continue working is to get paid for your work. It's a very difficult life and anyone who goes to art, art school has heard that 80% of you will walk out of the building and never make a piece of art again. That's not bullshit. It's amazing. And it's because they haven't found a way to sustain it. So I hope I answered your question. Um, well, to me, man, I want to paint that bus. Um, <laughs> and I don't want to... And I don't want to uh, I don't want to familiarize myself with the government and its trespassing laws in order to do that. So, um, there, for me, I mean, you guys have to understand, I knew I wanted to be an artist from day one. I knew, graffiti led me to murals. That's how I knew you could paint big outside. Um, and you know, an artist wants to get paid for their work, especially if you do it really well. Um, so the thing with Indigo, once they came to us, it was kind of a no-brainer. It was an easy, easy choice because 
I'm not going out and saying, look at my hardcore graffiti, I painted this bus. It's commercial art, and I'll tell you that immediately. It, it depicts the downtown transit center, which I'm super hyped for as a frequent bus passenger. We don't have a transit station in this city, and we're about to. I think it's going to change things a lot. Um, but yeah, I mean, if I want to paint that bus, and I do, I got to do it on their terms. So that was it. Uh, sorry, really quick, what? and street art to, uh, to elevate Indianapolis as a place that's open to new ideas and as a destination for that? Uh, help us get some walls for some property owners that aren't going to tell us what to put there. And I, and I mean, I'm serious. It's really hard to do, um, but that's what it's about. The, the only way we can really do what we want to do is if someone lets us paint their stuff and they don't tell us how to do it. Otherwise, it's just easier to go under the bridge or whatever. So. It used to be uh, to be commissioned by Eli Lilly, and then that happened. And then it used to be uh, to be commissioned by the Indy 500, and then that happened. Um, the ultimate dream to me is to be one of these people who does the national circuit and the international circuit. To, to be able to work on a large enough scale that you, your work is actually considered among the great contemporaries in the culture. Um, really, the goal is to expand so that we've got an audience way outside of our city. Man, you guys are awesome. Thank you. Really great questions. <laughs>